work so very hard all day long. I start to dream of you before I get home. Grilled cheese. I hope you're ready, cause we got a date. I just can't wait to get home and put you on my plate. Grilled cheese. Sandwich. The butter will start melting when I wipe the flame. Cause the butter and the cheese are gonna play a little game. It's called melting on the bread. Don't need a burger, don't need no shake. I'll whap in your face if you offer me cake. Don't waste my time with your Brussels sprouts. If you make me a steak, I'll just throw it out. I want a grilled cheese, not a BLT. Grilled cheese. Are you following me? Grilled cheese. I love you more than any other. I think I'm gonna make another grilled, 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 grilled cheese, if you please. Draco! Drag out that hog leg. Yes, sir. Get me some attention. Yeah! People! People! Welcome back to Girls Lacrosse Umpire in Training, Training for New Umpires Clinic. To remind you, this training accompanies the manual, Girls Lacrosse Umpire in Training Manual for the New Umpire. The first two sessions were covered in part one. Sessions 3, 4, and 5 are to be covered in Part 2. The three most important principles of umpiring as either the lead umpire or trail umpire are position, position, and position. Well, that may be a bit overstated, but you get the idea. Watch this ball boy get into position. They do. Wide open. Breaking free for the end zone. Here's Melvin Ray in a foot race. He scores! An umpire in training needs to learn to work a game as a part of a two-person crew. The umpire in training will need to understand positioning and field coverage with a partner. Generally, the umpires divide their areas of responsibility on the field in this manner. An umpire is the lead when the ball is moving toward the goal on his or her right. The lead umpire is on ball. That is, he or she is focused on play at and around the ball. The lead has overall responsibility for the critical scoring area, CSA, around his or her goal. The lead umpire stays ahead and outside of play at and around the ball. The lead umpire uses quadrant positioning when the ball is in or around the CSA. The rule of thumb is that the lead locates in the quadrant adjacent to the ball. The lead umpire shall also use tangent positioning in and around the critical scoring area. This concept simply means that the lead umpire positions himself or herself in order to see between the attacking player with the ball and the player defending her. If a line is drawn between the attacker with the ball and the defender, the umpire should be located perpendicular to this line. The lead umpire's partner is the trail umpire. 
As the name implies, this umpire trails the play. The trail umpire has responsibilities that complement, supplement, and balance the lead umpire. When the ball settles in the CSA, the trail umpire should be moving on an arc. The trail umpire is off ball. This umpire then has responsibility for all play that is not at or around the ball. This responsibility often includes play that is inside the CSA and at the restraining line. Such calls are shooting space, three seconds, and offsides. FSG or shooting space has already been presented. Three seconds and offsides are important off-ball calls for the trail to make. Offsides. A violation of the restraining line rule is considered offsides and a major foul. Seven field players from both teams are allowed over or below either restraining line, excluding the goalkeeper. Players may exchange places during play, but a player should have both feet out before a teammate crosses the restraining line. If a team is playing down with fewer players because of injury or not enough players on the roster, they may still have seven players below the restraining line. If a team is being penalized and a player is sitting in the penalty area, that team is allowed one less player across the restraining line. Three seconds. A player must not, while defending in the eight meter arc, remain in that area for more than three seconds unless she is marking an opponent within a stick's length. The player being marked may be outside of the eight meter arc. Three seconds may be called when the ball is across and inside the restraining line. With the exception of the defender who is marking the attack player who is directly behind the goal, marking means to be within a stick's length of an opponent, not a stick plus arm length, and not pointing at an attack player. Oftentimes, body language and movement will communicate that the trail umpire is focused on off-ball play. The trail umpire must maintain an appropriate relative position to the play as the ball advances down the field. The trail must stay wide and outside of play. A rule of thumb is wide as the widest, deep as the deepest. When play is transitioning, umpires are also transitioning from lead to trail. In transition, umpires will stay wide and outside of play. Staying outside of play will allow umpires to be in position to cover a boundary, whether sideline or endline. It is easy to see that a women's lacrosse umpire must have an appropriate level of physical fitness in order to officiate a game. And often assignments are multiple games. An umpire must have endurance, speed, and agility. 
For example, a high school JV and varsity doubleheader is a total of 100 minutes. One may estimate that an umpire will run a little more than 10 kilometers, 10K or 6.2 miles, at 15 minutes per mile. While this pace seems slow, one must remember that it is not steady. The umpire is sprinting, jogging, standing, jumping, and running backwards and sideways through the entire time. Speed is important as well. The ball travels fast in the air and high school athletes are often very fast. Low skilled speed teams seem to be the most challenging. A good resource for training is conditioning for high school sports officials. It is available at Amazon.com. Mechanics, penalty administration, and game management sound like unrelated topics gathered in a catch-all session. They're not. The draw has been presented in the session on fouls and violations. The focus here is on the umpire's role in the draw. In a two-person crew, the lead umpire, where the goal has been scored, retrieves the ball from the goalkeeper and tosses the ball to the former trail umpire who will administer the draw. Of course, if the umpires are switching sides of the field at this goal, then the former lead umpire keeps the ball and moves to execute the draw. As a side note, this moment is a time when the two umpires will pass one another around midfield a very brief conversation between umpires on any issues may take place at this time. The umpire who is executing the draw brings the center from each team together. The umpire places the ball in the wide part of both crossheads netting approximately above the center mark on the field. Both players should have one foot towing the center line. The umpire should not spend too much time getting the toes of the players exactly at the line. Either realize that the players are close enough or issue a card for delay of game. The crosses of both centers must be parallel to the ground and in the plane of the center line. Again, the umpire should determine what is close enough. The umpire should determine if too much time is being taken to set the centers with the ball in the correct place. The players are often remaining motionless in awkward positions that will tire their legs. If too much time is taken, take the ball back, have the players relax and take a breath, and then set the draw again. At the same time, the umpire should be comfortable in the draw. He or she should take charge of the draw with authority. It is best for the umpire to be centered on the center mark rather than trying to reach into the setup. Once the draw is set, the umpire says ready and backs out the center line toward the sideline opposite the trail umpire with arm raised above the head and whistle ready. Players along the center line at the center circle must understand that the umpire will be backing along the center line in order to see play between the two centers and movements of the crosses at the whistle. Both centers at the command ready must remain stationary except for their heads. Any movement below the neck is an illegal draw. The umpire blows the whistle and then lowers the arm in the start play action. Offsetting whistle and arm movement as well as varying the number of steps taken before the whistle is given ensures that neither center can anticipate the signal. At the whistle, both centers may move. The first motion of the cross must be straight up. The umpire must be in position to view this motion and which player is causing a violation. Ball does not go above the heads of both centers, a redraw is signaled and another draw is executed.
In a two-person crew, both umpires have responsibilities for the restraining line on their right. The trail umpire must remember that he or she is off ball. The draw and the center circle are the sole responsibility of the lead umpire, but the trail umpire should support the lead umpire in watching activity at the center circle behind the lead umpire during the draw. Immediately after the draw, both umpires should be aware of the activity at their respective restraining lines. Players behind the restraining line may not step on or over the line. Either umpire, usually the one closest to the ball, should signal possession when the ball is in the possession of a player. At this signal, the players are released. Now let's look at game management, the whistle, signals, and penalty administration. The umpire's voice includes the whistle. The umpire talks with the whistle. The umpire should blow the whistle clearly, loudly, and with authority. A peeless finger whistle is recommended. Another communication tool for the umpire is proper signaling. Signals communicate to everyone at the game, especially the partner and the coaches. Signals are shown in the rule book and the official's training manual. Make all signals big, visible, and at or above the shoulder. To start, the umpire in training should know several basic signals. Let's take a moment to look at some basic signals. Stand up, if you will, and follow the video. Cover. To execute this signal, cover one hand with the other and show direction the ball will be going. Dangerous follow through and dangerous propelling. The signal for both of these calls is to use both hands as if they were on a stick and simulate the shooting or throwing motion. Dangerous shot on the goalkeeper. The umpire uses an open hand, bringing it toward their face to make this signal. Directional. Always give direction with your back to the sideline with the arm pointing in the direction play will be moving. Do not signal across your body. Empty cross check. This signal is a hand clapping motion, which mimics two sticks making contact when neither stick is in contact with the ball. Illegal cradle in the sphere. Obstruction of the free space to goal or shooting space. Obstruction or shooting space, as it is frequently called, is signaled by placing your hands in a staggered position in front of your face, your palms facing toward you. Offside. To signal a defensive offside without stopping play, the trail official will raise one arm and wait to see if the defense can correct the offside quickly. If no correction takes place in a timely manner, stop play and correct the offside. Redraw. Rough check. Signal this foul by tapping your bicep while simultaneously indicating the direction the ball will continue moving in. Goal circle foul. Signal is to wave your arm tangent to the goal circle, followed by a directional signal which signifies if the foul was committed by the attack 
or the defense. Check into the sphere. Any check where a player's stick comes toward and into the other player's sphere, or a check which causes a player's own stick to come into her sphere, is a check toward the sphere, which is signaled by your hand coming toward your own face. Warding off. The signal for warding off mimics the motion a player would make by raising an arm up to protect herself and her stick from being defended by a nearby player. Once an umpire has recognized a foul or violation, blown the whistle, and given the signal, he or she is halfway there. Administration of the penalty for a foul or violation is the other half. Penalty administration may appear to be random to those who do not know its complexities. Penalty administration involves two variables, the type of foul or violation and the location of the foul or violation. A tool for understanding penalty administration is a two-sided card. This card should not be used during the game but may be used as a reference during halftime or before or after the game. Let's look at some basic principles for penalty administration. Remember, these are just basic principles of penalty administration. As in most things in girls lacrosse, there is always an exception. But we can say as a principle that there is no setup of a penalty closer than eight meters from the goal. Most setups, most, are at the point of the foul. There are some exceptions. Below the goal line extended, three seconds, offsides, and so on. Major fouls always involve placing the offender four meters behind, unless she has been carded. Minor fouls place everyone four meters away. Behind is a difficult concept for players to get. Behind is in relation to the goal ball line. The penalized team does not get an advantage with the penalty. And finally, B-O-O, -O, boo. Administering the penalty, the umpire should use the acronym BOO, B-O-O, -O, Ball, Offender, Others. In administering a penalty, first place the person who will have the ball at the restart. Next, place the offending player, the player who committed the foul or violation. Finally, all others are placed. Penalties are administered based in part on the location on the field. There are eight areas on the field. The center circle, the field itself, the restraining line and the areas defined by both restraining lines, the 12 meter fan, the critical scoring area, CSA, the CSA below the goal line, the 8 meter arc, and the goal circle. Most penalties are administered at the point of the foul. There are many exceptions to this rule, including fouls in the 8 meter arc, 
fouls below the goal line. Three seconds and offsides. Usually the lead umpire will administer all penalties within his or her CSA. The trail umpire will identify the player offended by number and jersey color, the offending player by number and jersey color, and the foul by voice and signal. Umpires should avoid pointing at a player and use an open hand to gesture. The four meter distance in all directions is important for administering penalties. A good estimate of four meters at a minimum is three sticks lengths. An umpire should not move excessively in administering penalties. Unfortunately, less experienced players do not often know where to go. An open-handed gesture should be enough to identify the location for the restart. The umpire should avoid moving around the field and pointing to locations. An umpire should never physically touch a player to move her to a location. The umpire's gestures and voice inflections may be well intended, but they are magnified on the field to players, coaches, and spectators. Take a breath, think before making a signal or gesture, or before saying something. Voice inflections and tone should be calm and impersonal. The trail umpire is responsible for the correct management of the restraining line. Some offsides calls need not be made, but noted. Any restraining line violation that has or could have an impact on play should be called. Players should be addressed only by jersey color and number. Names, nicknames, diminutives, words that could be misconstrued and suggesting intimacy, or accusatory words should be avoided. We are almost at the finish. Finish strong, like the team in the red shirts. They're currently in fifth place. Party meter heat here. It's going to be very, very difficult for Michelle Finn here, future Olympian, to rein this one in. She's got too much of a gap. Can she hold her off CIT here in third place as DCU set off at a strong pace as UCC look good in fifth and look that they were passing DCU into fourth place. The big battle here is the second call. It is. It's between Cork and that oh, is I UL at the moment. Soon. CIT and UL, but it can. The Look UCL at Michelle is fading, and Michelle Finn to turbo blast rejects of the steeple chill specialist. Hello. Are being turned on with 2.50 to go. Eight meters to get there. Six meters. Oh, five UL meters. Get this she is going to go past the UCL. She is out on her feet. Michelle Finn, the future Olympian, powers on by. Here comes CIT. Another effort in the home stretch. And here comes UCC. I think we're going to get third. You see, see from the depths of hell are pouring through. Oh, Michelle Finn is dead. She's dead. An umpire shall conduct himself or herself with appropriate comportment, communication, and teamwork. An umpire shall show respect for all persons involved in the game. What we've got here is failure to communicate. To recapitulate from earlier sessions, an umpire shall communicate using controlled voice and body language and have a calm, confident, and respectful attitude toward all persons involved in the game. The umpire has responsibility for protecting all persons involved in the game from any misconduct from spectators. Anything an umpire thinks is misconduct is misconduct. 
Spectators must not be allowed to become abusive to the players on the field and or to the umpires. Nor must they be allowed to become unruly or interfere with the orderly progress of the game. Direct contact between the umpire and an abusive spectator is not advised. If an umpire is confronted with an unruly or abusive spectator, he or she should follow this procedure. 1. The umpire calls a timeout and approaches the appropriate head coach during a stoppage of play. The umpire requests that the appropriate head coach or the site manager speak with the spectator about the behavior. This request should not become a confrontation between the umpire and the head coach. 2. The umpire should not threaten the head coach with a card. The umpire's partner should be made aware of what is happening. The game should continue while the spectator is being warned unless the situation warrants stopping the game. 3. If the spectator's misconduct continues and the head coach cannot resolve the situation, the umpire should call a timeout and approach the head coach a second time. The umpire should inform the head coach that if the situation is not resolved, he or she will receive a yellow card. If the misconduct continues, the umpire should follow the procedures previously outlined for carding the head coach. The official's training manual contains helpful information for dealing with all sorts of misconduct situations. An important part of learning and growing as an umpire is on-field experience and feedback from a partner. Always seek feedback from a partner. All umpires are ambassadors for the game of women's lacrosse. Umpires should not shun respectful questions after or before the game about the sport of lacrosse and its rules in general. An umpire should never venture to answer a question about a particular call during any particular game or by a particular umpire. Finally, being a lacrosse umpire requires clear communication with the game partner. Eye contact and other nonverbal signals are essential, especially when doing restarts. Normally, the trail umpire will allow the lead umpire to reposition for a restart. An arm high in the air indicates that a particular umpire will take the whistle on a restart or needs to pause a moment. A low hand with open palm indicates the umpire is ready for the partner to restart. Did you ever have the feeling that you wanted to go and still have the feeling that you wanted to stay? You knew it was right, wasn't wrong, still you knew you wouldn't be very long. It's tough to have the feeling that you wanted to go, still have the feeling that you wanted to stay. Start to go, change your mind, start to go again, but change your mind again. It's tough to have the feeling that you wanted to go, still have the feeling that you wanted to stay. Don't read me for so lusty, do I go. You've made it. Do you have any questions? This is a song about being happy. That's right. It's the happy, happy, joy, joy song. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Happy, happy, joy, happy, happy, joy, joy. 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 I don't think you're happy enough.